I'm going to talk about, I think, what, probably one of the most significant reports that has emerged th uh, this summer, the value for money and policy review of disability service. I'm going to say something about resource allocation systems, and then I'm going to talk about the NDA study in this area and next steps. Before I get into talk about the value for money and policy review, just to say a little bit about what our current system of resource allocation in disability services Charles used the words random and arbitrary, and maybe that's slightly unfair, but basically our system of resource allocation for disability services is what you got last year in the good times plus a, few, plus a standard percentage, in the bad times minus a standard percentage. And in the good times there was also some new money, and then that new money got built in and became part of the standard percentage. So we have some organisations that got money in the past, in the dim and distant past, uh, through maybe ministerial intervention or whatever, and that formed their baseline budget. Some organisations got money related possibly to dealing with people at an early stage in life. Those people now may be you know, in their 60s and 70s and with complications like dementia, and still their base budget is the same. So we have a situation where what different disability organisations are getting and the money going for different disability services really does not in any way systematically relate to need. And that's what a resource allocation uh, system is trying to do, is to relate uh, allocations to need. We also spend uh, about three quarters of our money in disability services goes for day and residential services. And they are primarily but not exclusively, services for people with intellectual disabilities. We spend less money, or a sm relatively small fraction of our budget on things like rehabilitation, and what Charles has talked about, community uh, primary care services like physios and OTs that keep people on their feet and bring them back on their feet if they've, they, 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 they have uh, ha had an, an episode. And we spend relatively little on assistive technology relative to the, to the other areas. So the big money and the, of the, the day and residential services, the big money is in residential services. And we have about 8,000 people with intellectual disabilities living in residential services, plus about 1,000 people with physical and sensory disabilities living in residential services. And that accounts for roughly half the disability budget. So the value for money and policy review made a number of recommendations around resource allocations. It said resource allocations, instead of being this arbitrary, what you got last year, plus or minus, should be based on a standard assessment of service user needs. There should be a way of costing those needs, so somebody with high support needs would, would be priced in at higher, uh, uh, and, and somebody with lower support needs, that, that would be, be, be um, priced in at a different rate. To identify how much of those needs will be met, and the quantum and cost of services received. They talked about moving towards a resource allocation model based on service user needs, taking account of the amount of resources available, and having a framework for distribution of available resources to meet assessed needs in a fair way. And talked about systems for eligibility and prioritization. Again, Charles has made the point, I suppose, that sometimes you can't do everything, and how are you going to prioritize? Is it going to be on a fair and transparent basis, or is it going to be on a basis that is essentially arbitrary or when the budget has run out towards the end of the year? They also recommended ending the current system where budgets were based on what you got last year. They talked about funding people rather than places. And again, echoing what Charles says, is focus on funding what you want to have achieved to to fund programmes where the objectives, the outputs and the outcomes of each element of the budget is specified. So that again is moving away from just block grant funding St. Ethna's Disability Service or St. Charles's Disability Service towards a situation where you're putting money into specific programmes towards achieving specific objectives for individuals. They also recommended that in developing the new resource allocation framework they should build on the work the research we're doing which we're going to talk about on the value for money review and move to a new funding model over the medium term. The model should be fair, transparent, 
but also allow for innovation and flexibility. And that's a really important aspect because if you just fund people to do things in the old way, maybe you're not going to open uh, new possibilities, for example, the deployment of new assistive technology or new ways of delivering more person-centered services uh, li like the community connector uh, idea that we heard from Vicky earlier. It's important that any system, if you're allocating to a formula uh, based on people being maybe in a low, medium or high cost bracket, that you're also in a position to address exceptional needs. To take into account any overarching resource allocation model across social care, what they mean by that is looking at is there going to be a system of resource allocation in place for older person services or for children's services and should we be operating on the same system? And that moving towards this adjusted resource allocation model should come via the service level agreement. So over a period, we should be moving towards that new way uh, of allocating funds. On individualization services, we had had the expert uh, uh, reference group which had recommended very much reorienting services away from funding the service to funding the person and giving people more choice and control. And that, if you like, policy thrust was endorsed by the Value for Money review to move towards a person-centred service model where unit costing would be the basis. I talked about different forms of individualised bu uh, budgeting, money following the person, people being able to buy a mix of supports from different agencies, and the option of personal budgets where the individual would buy in and choose their own services. It talked about transfer of choice and control, but it said first you develop the resource allocation model and then we look at piloting, testing and establishing alternative service options. The Department of Public Expenditure and Reform was a bit wary about moving towards a personal budget model on the grounds that we don't know what this is going to cost, we don't know what it's going to deliver, we need to try it out and move, move in stages in this way. Analyse the benefits in the Irish context and set up adequate financial management, resource allocation and governance structures. Because we are talking about probably as you move towards a personal budget model and some of the organisations that have piloted this have found this, the, the need, for example, for change legislation and certainly for change governance arrangements around personal budgets. So what do resource allocation systems that are around the individual, what do they look like? We usually start off with a needs assessment process where individual people's needs are assessed according to a standard assessment tool. So the same assessment applies whether you live in Cork or whether you live in Donegal and people are assessed in the same way. Now we don't have a single assessment system. There are different assessments that apply in different areas and our resource allocation system is not based on needs assessment. Similarly, in the elder care area, where there are uh, assessments at the moment for fair deal and for home care packages, again, we are far from having a single assessment uh, tool. And that's something that the elder care services are moving towards. <coughs> having done the needs assessment, that usually gives somebody a points score. And then needs, different needs assessment processes have a standardised formula that can convert points into money. Now, resource allocation systems can be used to do different things. They can be used uh, on a needs assessment basis to look at resource allocation within agencies. St John of God Services, for example, are using the supports intensity scale to allocate resources internally within their service as between different service users based on an assessment of need. It can be used to allocate funding as between agencies. And again, that's a key message coming out of the value for money review. And resource allocation systems can be used as the basis for personal budgets. And I'm going to just get a glass of water. So what are the benefits of personalized funding? First of all, it ensures that money goes to where it's most needed. So it's a more efficient and equitable allocation of scarce resources. When you put the money in the hands of individuals or when you give people vouchers or choice over where the money on their head travels, 
people are able to choose what happens. So this, at the moment, our model is that people, if you like, money flows in the name of somebody with a disability to a disability service provider, and then the individual is allocated to a disability service provider. So that connection between the individual and the money is, is, is broken. So enabling people to choose what kind of services and what kind of life they want to lead. We talked about most of the money being for people with intellectual disabilities, for day services, and half the money going for people in residential services. That really is about the totality of people's lives and the importance of giving people choices with how that money is spent and what kind of life it gives to them. When people are given choice, that can lead to enhanced quality of services. It offers the potential to leverage service innovations to try new ways of doing things around what the individual sees as important for their life. And there also can be potential for cost savings. And there are some lessons for us here in relation, for example, to, to the uh, personal budget uh, work in, 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 in England, where so, there were some savings that were generated, and some, some studies suggest up to around 9%, uh, by people choosing, if you like, a low-cost, easy option than of, like paying a neighbour to come in and maybe help you get out of bed in the morning, rather than having somebody very professionalised coming and you know, being paid mileage to come to your house and get you out of bed and so on. So there were some potential for cost savings. But one of the big areas they found and that gave people satisfaction was that people got to choose when they went to bed. Because we know, for example, in our own... Uh, um, intellectual disability services from the, the uh, TILDA study that Mary McCarran and her team at Trinity have done, is that a very significant number of people with intellectual disabilities, particularly those living in those more congregated uh, residential centres, do not choose when they go to bed. Many people living in the community don't choose when they go to bed because the home helper, the care worker, comes to them at an hour that suits the care worker, not the individual. So one of the benefits of the personal budget approach in England has been that people, particularly elderly people, were able to pay a neighbour to pop in and help them go to bed at a time when it suited them to go to bed, rather than going to bed at eight o'clock when it suited somebody in a professionalised service. We started looking in the National Disabilities uh, uh, Authority at the area of resource allocation primarily in the beginning from the point of view of what kind of resource allocation model would lead to more individualised services, more choice, personal budgeting. So we, did, we started off with the review of the literature and look at what tools were being used in other jurisdictions around the area of individual resource allocation. And Christine, who you heard earlier, uh, did a, a major literature review, which you can read on our website, about well-validated, well-researched uh, ways of assessing need as a basis for that personalised individual resource allocation. So we boil down our consideration to two instruments. One is a thing called the RAS5, that's Resource Allocation System 5, developed by InControl in the UK and used you know, in various variants by a lot of uh, British local authorities. And the other one we looked at, again, very well validated in the re research literature, the Supports Intensity Scale, which is developed by the American Association of Intellectual Disability Directors. So it was designed originally around intellectual disability, but has also been used particularly by people like Will Buntings in the, in the Netherlands uh, in the context of identifying needs and allocating resources for people with physical and sensory disabilities. So we decided, rather than just take anything off the shelf, that we would look at these two different approaches and trial them out in the field. So phase one is a field trial of the questionnaires, and phase two, which we haven't yet undertaken, will be looking at how best you can get from points scores on a standardised needs assessment tool to the money. And there are different ways of building up the money. You can uh, uh, look at... Do you cost in the different items of service? Do you look at what people with a similar profile would get or would cost if you were to commission out those services? Do you look at some kind of statistical relationship between what's already being spent on people at a particular degree of need and the amount of money in the system? So there are different ways of doing that, and we're going to do a study on that down the road as phase two of this piece of work. 
The supports intensity scale is quite a detailed um, um, instrument with 57 life activities and 27 behavioural and medical areas and it asks how often do you need help, how much help do you need and what type of help you need. And then they, you get a score based on this and it's translated to where on the percentage distribution you sit. So how many, you know, are you in the top 5% or the top 10%? by way of score, in which case you're likely to be in the top five or the top 10% by way of cost. And many, many of the US states use the supports intensity scale and each of them has developed their own, if you like, mathematical formula for translating CIS scales uh, into how much money uh, would be given uh, uh, for, for somebody. Now, the disadvantage of the CIS is that it doesn't actually ask how much support you have at home. So, obviously, a huge difference in cost is whether somebody is just going to a day service or, and, uh, you know, have the support of their family at home at night or whether they're in full residential care and it doesn't pick up that. So, they need to add that back into the formula. The in-control resource allocation tool, the RAS5, is simpler, shorter, what I call cheap and cheerful. There's variations of this used by different local authorities in the UK, and the local authorities in Britain are the people who do the social services, the personal social services. Each of them has developed its own, what they call the pounds for points formula to determine budget. The process works by sitting down with somebody, scoring them, using that to derive an indicative budget, normally a few bob is held in the back pocket and not put on the table day one, and then on the basis of that indicative budget, they discuss the person's, um, how their needs can be met out of that budget, and that is used then to derive a final budget. And if you look at the different domains, um, the, the first number of them are much the same. The questions are asked in different language, but they're much the same. They ask about personal care. You know, can you wash yourself? Can you dress yourself? Can you go to the loo by yourself? Etc. Can you feed yourself? Can you make your own meals? Can you do your shopping, the activities of daily living? Have you needs around communication, work and community life, behaviour support and making decisions? And then the supports intensity scale goes on in more detail and asks about friends and relationships, education, health and medical. And I suppose this being more detailed, in America they say you need to have a degree to be able to administer it. Um, I don't know, is that about the US education system or is it you know, actually needed or is it the, the instrument is a bit ambiguous? But there's a lot of training. The Americans wanted us to do a week's training before anybody was allowed loose on this uh, um, uh, instrument to, to, to interview anybody. So I said we have a compl more complex one which we have to pay royalties for and a more cheap and cheerful. So we did a study to see, well, what are the strengths and weaknesses of those? And we trained 16 people, but 15 people actually took part in the interviews. And I'd like to thank the Federation of Voluntary Bodies and the individual service providers who gave us free of charge, if you like, individuals in services to do those interviews. And 112 people across a range of disabilities and uh, are balanced different parts of the country, men and women, uh, different kinds of living situations agreed to take part in the study and our biggest gratitude goes to that group of people because they had one long interview in the morning and another long interview in the afternoon and they shared what they felt and uh, the, there was no kind of cash money coming to them at the end of it it was purely if you like taking part in the studies we collected anonymized scores and feedback she sheets from all the participants from the interviewers from the persons with disabilities who are interviewed and from people who accompany them. And the findings, we're not quite finished off yet, but the preliminary findings are both tools are highly acceptable. There's very small tweaks needed. The CIS took twice as long, gave more complex information, but actually the correlation between the two was very simple. And one of the main differences would be on how challenging behavior is scored. So what's our next step? Again, as the Minister mentioned this morning, across the older person service, they're looking at a single way of, of, of doing assessments. And there's a new one has come on, onto the family called Interray. We're going to examine its disability assessment tool. 
And I think there's a choice really to be made by the HSE and the Department of Health of whether you want a cheap and cheerful single assessment tool that does assessment of need and decides how much money people get and that's all you do, or whether we want assessments to do more, to allocate funds, assess needs, eligibility for services and to build a bigger picture of the person. And you might go for a more complex and more expensive assessment tool if that's what you're doing. And we're going to carry out the costing uh, section of the study. So in conclusion, the current allocation system needs to change. Money needs to match people's needs. We're doing research to provide the evidence base for the choice of system, and that must be based on transparency, fairness, and choice for the individual. Thank you.